Civil on hearing versus roundtable, and there's a Hask hearing right downstairs. We'll probably have people coming in, coming out, but this is such an important topic. We have a great panel. I'd like to go all the way back to uh, 1959 when the Soviet Union shocked the world by putting uh, a, Sputnik, a Sputnik satellite into orbit. Uh, but rather than becoming discouraged, the country was galvanized into action. And 55 years ago, led by the brave and brilliant men and women of NASA, uh, they succeeded in getting to the moon first. And their success demoralized the Soviets such that they never reached the moon at all. And the superiority of the American system demonstrated by the space race and our determination in the face of an adversary took the luster off Soviet communism and may well have contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union decades later. Um, I think we need that same spirit today. Uh, I was thinking a bit about uh, President Reagan in 84 describing space as a new frontier and said that our willingness to accept the challenge of space exploration will reflect whether America's men and women today have the same bold vision, the same courage, and indomitable spirit that made us a great nation. Uh, Reagan certainly understood the potential of space as a new frontier of scientific, economic, and even military exploration, he realized that if America opted out of exploring this new frontier, as he termed it, it would not remain untouched and pristine, but fall prey to nefarious actors who did not share our values. We face that similar dilemma today. Uh, from solar panels to electric vehicles to the Internet itself, imprisoned behind a great firewall, the entire world has witnessed how the Chinese Communist Party will corrupt and weaponize any technology in any field they gain a monopoly over. Whether we wish to partake or not, there is a new space race, one the Chinese Communist Party is determined to win, and we simply cannot let them. So today's event is designed to discuss space as an area of competition between the United States and the PRC that really transcends the military, civil, and commercial domains. So we'll also look at broader supply chain and technology transfer concerns around space technology, especially surrounding dual-use technology. Uh, again, we have incredible experts here today. Uh, we have former colleagues. Um, I'm trying to become a former colleague. Of, uh, we'll see if I'm able to escape. Uh, but uh, that's right. There is, yeah, the, that's right. Uh, and Roger was making fun of me for my obsession with UP today, so we won't go into that uh, today. But our mission here today is not about relitigating the past, but finding right policies for the future. We want to find the best ways to maintain U.S. primacy in space technology for generations to come. And so I have no doubt that we can prevail, but we just need to muster the willpower to do it. And with that, I'd like to recognize the ranking member. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And given that you don't have any elections coming up, I was really hoping that you would do the Vulcan greeting to start the uh, meeting uh, and really create some oppo uh, on you. But, yeah. um, but in all seriousness, it's great to see all of you. And Jim, our former colleague, is back. So thank you so much for coming in as well. And thank you to our distinguished guests. Look, I think that all of you know that you know, space has kind of, um, kind of energized the imagination. It's kind of it's been an inspiring uh, journey for the nation. Um, and we, you know, since we landed the moon, landed on the moon in 1969, to uh, who can forget the first robot rover on Mars, and the wonder that we, uh, with which we observed that, uh, and then of course what we've seen from NASA's Hubble telescope has just been mind-boggling. Um, and I think that at, at our best, um, exploring space has um, kind of uh, rekindled our imaginations, uh, unified our country, and really unified humanity, if you think about it. Now, the CCP also understands the importance of space, and uh, unfortunately, some of the statements that they've made about space have been a little bit concerning. Uh, they said it's the ultimate high ground. And similar to wanting to control territory in the South China Sea, uh, they've talked about uh, conquering portions of space. Um, so I brought a couple of visuals just to... Of course, to, of course. Um, what's very interesting is I just learned about this uh, over the last few days, the Lagrange points around the Earth and the Moon. And this is the Earth, and here's the Moon, and there are five basically strategic parking spots uh, in the gravitational uh, pull uh, between the Moon and the Earth where uh, different assets can be parked in those places uh, for various purposes. And unfortunately, what we understand that the CCP is trying to control those particular parking spots for navigation, positioning, and surveillance in space. Um, OD, ODNI's 2024 threat assessment states that by 2030, 
China will achieve world-class status in all but a few technology areas. Um, they've already developed civilian and military assets in space, including kinetic kill missiles. Uh, they landed the first rover to explore the dark side of the moon, and in quite a technological feat, they actually now have a permanent space station called Tiangong, and it was stationed uh, in space in 2021. I mean, this is really uh, an incredible technological feat for them to put that up there. Now they have 900 satellites in orbit, half of which have the ability to detect and track U.S. aircraft carriers as well as um, naval movements. And so I would hope that someday we can once again engage in cooperation with China and the PRC with regard to space, space exploration. But at the moment, under Xi Jinping, there is a real space race. And so given that fact, um, we have to up our game, uh, work with our partners and allies uh, in exploring space, in creating the rules of the road for space. And I really look forward to hearing from all of you and my distinguished colleagues uh, about ways that we can work together on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have three incredible witnesses. The Honorable Jim Bridenstine was the 13th Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I think we over, only overlapped on Hask for about a year or two, but it was a beautiful overlap. It was amazing. It was, yeah. <laughs> uh, the uh, General Retired, John W. Raymond, served as the first Chief of Space Operations for the United States Space Force from 2019 to 2022. And Mr. Tori Bruno is the President and CEO of United Launch Alliance, an American aerospace manufacturer. With that, I want to welcome all of our witnesses and thank them for being here this morning. Mr. Bronstein, you are now recognized for your opening remarks. So I, I'll just piggyback on some of what you guys have already talked about, if that's okay. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, Chairman, you mentioned the Strategic Defense Initiative, Ronald Reagan, and, and you, you, followed, you preceded that with discussion about the 1969 moon landing. Um, it, it should be noted that the reason the Strategic Defense Initiative was so effective, even though we spent hardly any money on it, of course it was called the Star Wars program at the time, but the reason it was so effective is because the Soviets believed we could achieve it. Uh, here in the United States, people said it's too expensive, not technologically achievable, um, it, it will never be complete, all those types of things. And while, while all of that was quite accurate, the Soviets believed we could achieve it for one reason. They saw just 12 or 13 years prior to that, they saw people walking on the surface of the moon, an accomplishment they were not able to achieve. So these types of stunning achievements, and Raj, I should say ranking member, you mentioned specifically the Mars landers and the rovers. Um, and, and, and those are those types of stunning achievements as well. Um, so so it, it not only provides a piece of information that can deter an opponent, or a competitor in this case, but it also can inspire a nation. And, and that is why it's important for this country to have these stunning achievements moving forward. Um, ranking member, you mentioned cislunar space. You talked about the Lagrangian points. There are other areas around the moon where, or the earth moon, you know, any area where the earth moon gravity the, the, the gravity well of the Earth and the gravity well of the Moon, there's shared space where assets can balance there. You have the Lagrangian points. There are others. There, there's, we talked a lot at NASA about the near rectilinear halo orbit. There are other halo orbits where assets can station for long periods of time without using very much fuel at all. This is why it is so important for us as a nation to do things like have domain awareness in cislunar space even beyond those Lagrangian points that you, that you demonstrated. We need domain awareness, we need navigation, we need communication for those specific domains. I'll, I'll finish by saying, and the question is why? Why is, um, most of our highest value assets are in geostationary orbit when we think about our nuclear command and control and our missile warning and those types of things. And if those assets can be attacked from above, uh, that, that's a huge vulnerability where we need to know what's happening. You know, General Saltzman talks about the fact that um, we, need, we need to, you know, avoid operational surprise. 
Well, the only way to avoid operational surprise is to have domain awareness that is superior to anything that's ever existed before, and, and we, need, we need to get there quickly. Uh, so so the, the cislunar domain is critically important. Ranking member, you also mentioned the Chinese space station. I want to be really clear. The value of space um, right now is immense. It's going to grow exponentially as people start understanding what the value of microgravity is. Uh, we can create pharmaceutical crystals in space that will transform medicine on Earth. We're talking about medicines that exist today that take, I'm talking about cancer treatments, that take three to four months before we can determine whether or not they're efficacious. We can get that, we can get that down to two to three weeks based on how crystals form in space in the microgravity space compared to how they form on Earth. They, they, can, they can form in a more perfect way. We can create new and different types of crystals. We can create crystals that will treat diseases that right now are not treatable. But we're only at the beginning. People say it's the tip of the iceberg. I would say it's not an iceberg at all. We understand an iceberg. When it comes to microgravity space, this is a, this is a whole new kind of territory. And, and, and we have developed this capability to understand it with the International Space Station. Um, and here's, the, here's my fear. My fear is the International Space Station is going to come to its end, which, by the way, needs to happen. That needs to be a certainty. Why? Because private companies right now are capitalizing commercial space stations. And, and we need certainty as to what the future looks like so that that capital can continue to flow. We need numerous space stations um, that are privately capitalized where they are competing for customers. One of the customers will be NASA or the U.S. government in general. General Raymond and I were talking earlier about how there's a national security imperative to this as well. Uh, but but we, need, we need to make sure that the only nation that develops, and I talked about pharmaceutical crystals, we're talking about regenerative medicine, we can grow tissue. Chairman, we can take your skin cells, we can reverse them into stem cells, we can then create your tissue that is you, heart tissue, nerve tissue, vein tissue. It, it, your, your body won't reject it because it is in fact you. Today it's tissue, tomorrow it's going to be full organs. This has, we just brought home from the International Space Station a brand new meniscus that was 3D printed in space, uh, designed for a very specific person. So these capabilities are going to be transformational for regenerative medicine, but it's also advanced materials we're creating. We have created artificial retinas for the human eyeball, so people who have macular degeneration don't have to go blind. Like these, are, these are things you can't do in the gravity well of Earth. And now that we're finally understanding it, we're at risk of losing the International Space Station without our own commercial space stations and China is going to be the only game in town. And all of our international partners that we have paid to build their capacity, they're all going to be looking to China for a space station. Um, so I know there's broad agreement on this panel on these issues. Gentlemen, you, you identified some key ones right out of the gate, uh, but space is critical. Not you, you think about the whole, you know, the dying theory of national power, diplomatic power, information, military, economic. Space plays in every one of them. The economic power, we're only scratching the surface right now, but diplomatic, we have international relationships, critically important. Information, that's the strategic defense initiative. It's, it's the Apollo program. And on the military side, I'll leave it to, to General Raymond. But uh, thank you guys for, uh, for this conversation. Thank you. General Raymond, you recognize for everybody's sake. Thank you, Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Chris Morthy, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to, to participate today in the roundtable. Uh, having retired as the United States Space Force's first Chief of Space Operations in December of 2022, I appear before you today in a personal capacity and not representing any government or any commercial entity. I applaud the work of this committee, uh, this important committee, and I feel privileged to appear alongside Jim Bridenstine and Tori Bruno, uh, two gentlemen that I am privileged to call friends. Although I retired, I remain resolute in the fact that assured access to space and freedom to maneuver in, to, and from space are vital national interests. This access serves as the foundation for, as, as Jim just said, for all of our instruments of national power against all competitors, especially regarding the effectiveness of military forces. It elevates our status as a global great power. It helps us attract global allies and partners, allows for science and, and exploration, and historically, even in times of war, has provided an option for cooperation among nations. 
I also firmly believe that the space domain offers our nation the best opportunity to deter conflict and maintain global stability and security. Unfortunately, we no longer have the luxury of taking this access to space and the advantages that that access provides for granted. Um, intensifying strategic competition with China presents a serious threat to U.S. national security, and that competition extends into the space domain. I believe that that competition over the next 10 years might be the most critical 10 years in the history of our space program, and we cannot afford to lose. Fortunately, in 2019, with the strong support of a bipartisan Congress, the United States established the United States Space Force. Thanks to your legislation, it is clear that we are better postured today than we were just four years ago. But there remains much work to do to stay ahead of uh, the, this pacing Chinese threat so that we can compete and deter and win in space in order not to have to do that in other domains. China has a robust space program that is a source of national pride and key to President Xi's China dream to establish a powerful and prosperous nation. China is building a full suite of counter space capabilities to threaten U.S. systems in all orbits, while at the same time they're building and integrating into their military operations an impressive array of space capabilities that rival those of the United States. China's space-enabled military can detect, locate, track, target, and therefore strike U.S. forces, placing them at great risk, a risk that we can't accept. DOD's pivot to a more distributed and resilient architecture helps deny China the benefit of attacking our satellites and reduces the first mover advantage that currently is associated with our current architecture. We need to keep our foot on the accelerator and complete the transition uh, to move off the legacy architecture, which is extremely costly. This is the most consequential work the Space Force has accomplished since its establishment. Although resilience is a priority, resilience alone is not enough. To protect our land, air, and maritime forces, the United States must have the ability to achieve space superiority and to do so with responsible counter space activity. We must be able to impose costs on an adversary to more effectively deter actions that place our joint force under great risk. We need to accelerate our counter space efforts to protect our joint force. I've really appreciated the Department's and Congress's favorable budget prioritization for space over the last few years. However, I am very concerned about the funding reduction in this year's Space Force budget. Now is not the time for decreasing or flat space budgets. I agree with General Saltzman. The Space Force is a work in progress. We need to complete this work, and we need to do so at speed. China is not slowing down. This budget reduction increases the risk to both our space capabilities, our joint force, and our ability to compete, deter, and win. Timely budgets that prioritize both resilience and space security are critical to our national security. With all the challenges uh, come opportunities. With every challenge comes opportunities. And I do believe with congressional support, we can capitalize on the many opportunities that are associated with space. First, we need to continue to develop new and, and mature existing partnerships. That is a strength of the United States. We are clearly stronger together. We need to continue to lead the development of norms of behavior to shape what we consider a safe and responsible behavior in this domain, rather than being shaped by our adversaries. We need to develop rules so the Space Force can have a more fused relationship with commercial industry to be able to capitalize on this innovation that's occurring in commercial industry. Uh, it is a U.S. competitive strength, and we need to do everything we can do to harness that strength. We need to review current trade regulations to ensure that we keep critical technologies out of the hands of our adversaries, but also enabling us to work closely with our allies and partners. And finally, uh, investing in first-rate education and training for our guardians, for our people represent our greatest strength. Again, sir, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with these two gentlemen, and I thank you for your opportunity. General, Mr. Bruno, you're now recognized. Thank you. Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member of Christian University, and distinguished members of the committee. It's an honor and a privilege to speak before you on this pressing matter of competition between the United States and China, a great power competition. And from this point forward, I will be your personal rocket scientist, and as such, I must compliment the Ranking Member on his uh, budding understanding of orbital mechanics <laughs> and the significance. 
Well, you handled it well, sir, and the significance of Lagrange points is right on. The near rectilinear halo orbit that Jim referred to, by the way, is an L2 orbit. So they are, in fact, that important. I think it's important that we also recognize that space has simultaneously become much more important to U.S. national security while also becoming so much more vulnerable to our adversaries, especially China. It's no longer a force multiplier for us like it once was. Space is now required for basic military effectiveness. Without it, it's not that our forces are better, it's that they are essentially impotent. And where once we were worried about terrestrial uh, conflicts extending into space, we now know and understand that that will begin in space and then extend down to the ground. Consequently, China understands this as well, and they have invested heavily in space over the last two decades, billions of dollars of time and effort. Uh, they possess four to five times the number of rockets, the number of launch sites, and the personnel working in space than we, in fact, do here in the United States. They have acquired most of their technology from us by illegal, legal, and even industrial infiltration means. And CFIUS, for example, must absolutely evolve. It is a good foundation, but this is now a great power competition where we will uh, close off avenues and they will open new ones. So it cannot be static for decades at a time anymore from this point forward. You know, with this capability and the technology they have taken from us, they have gone from a few dozen spacecraft on orbit to nearly 700 here just to, in a span of a few years. Their birds are everywhere from LEO, a scant 500 kilometers above your head, all the way out to GEO at 30,000 kilometers and beyond. While our fundamental technology remains superior to China, and I say that with great confidence and knowledge of the subject, they have invested heavily in applying those basic technologies to space weapons and anti-satellite capabilities, and they are deploying those right now at a shockingly rapid pace. But we have opportunities to counter this. While vast, their infrastructure is inefficient it is expensive, and it is brittle with respect to prolonged economic stress and a curtailment or cessation of Western investment, which, by the way, is almost half a trillion dollars a year into China's economy, could cripple that capability that they have now. So that is an opportunity we have through our economy, our allies, and our whole of government approach. While they have developed space weapons of novel types, they remain very, very dependent on acquiring technology from the United States on an ongoing basis. So this must be curtailed as well. And while they have a 20-year lead on us in this regard, only a handful of innovative technologies and capabilities could leapfrog all of that and make it entirely irrelevant. For example, we here at ULA, I have been investing in upper stage technologies that have recently gone through war games and shown to have a deterrent effect. Uh, in short, we are driving towards providing our country with an on-orbit Navy that could ensure the freedom of navigation of Earth orbit. Those are the kind of capabilities that will render all of that Chinese investment in time irrelevant and send them back to the showers. China's infiltration of our industrial base must stop. We must force them to develop their own technologies from scratch, which they are not well prepared to do within a command economy, unlike our system, that fosters competition and innovation. We can lever that culture of innovation and industrial partnership between government and private industry to make those Chinese capabilities irrelevant in just one fell swoop. So I look forward to your questions today, and I appreciate the work of the committee on this very important and pressing topic. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, okay, so uh, last week, uh, the Prime Minister of Japan uh, addressed Congress, gave a great speech, and at one point near the end, recognized two of his astronauts that I think were going to the International Space, or just come from the International Space. Yeah, okay, something. Uh, clearly, I was paying attention. Um, but they're, they're going to the moon. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, it was a great moment, and it just makes me wonder. Obviously, one of our relative advantages compared to China is that we have this network of allies and partners. They're, they're allies and partners, or well, they don't consider them allies, they consider them sort of vassals, and they're a rogue gallery of Russia, Iran, North Korea. What allies or partners or, or countries that may not fit neatly into either of those categories do you view as most crucial to winning this race with China going forward? Generally, you look like you're eager to comment, uh, but I want everyone to, to weigh in. Space is, a, <clears throat> space is a team sport. You have It's a global domain. You have to have allies and partners. Historically, on the national security space business, we haven't had the partners that we've needed uh, in the domain. The domain was peaceful, benign, without a threat. And really, back then, you really didn't need them. I worked very closely with Jim. This is one of the areas that NASA and, and the Space Force cooperated on. Most of our partnerships were through NASA. Mm. Today, I will tell you, the second most consequential thing that Space Force has done, besides the re-architecting of on-orbit capabilities is developing and maturing those partnerships. So today, the partnerships for the Space Force are the Five Eyes partners, plus um, France, Germany, and, and Japan. And then just this uh, last year, we've added to that Italy and Norway. And so we call those our combined space operations partners, CSPO, you'll hear it referred to. Those are our closest partners. We have sharing agreements where we share space uh, uh, data awareness information with with many 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 others, but those that we operate together, train together, war game together, now build capabilities together, like we're doing with both Norway and Japan. Uh, those would be the countries that I would uh, that I would say are our closest. I would like to uh, further a relationship with India because I think that's going to be hugely important in the future as well. Great, right. uh, Jim. Uh, I would say um, on the national security side. I know that they are focused at Space Systems Command on Allied by Design. I hear that all the time from folks over on that side. On the NASA side, we don't do national security and defense, so we have the opportunity to partner with a lot of countries that you normally wouldn't see us partnering with. Um, when Eisenhower created NASA, there was a strong effort to put it inside the Department of the Army, and Eisenhower said, no, we're going to have a separate independent agency that has the ability to focus on science, technology, um, but also diplomacy. And so if you go back in time, you have seen NASA as a great tool of diplomacy, even in the height of the Cold War, after six moon landings, we partnered with the Soviets on the, the Apollo Soyuz program, which was you know, a, a channel of communication and a tool of diplomacy uh, that was novel at the time. We went from, from that to the Shuttle Mir program, and then we went onto the International Space Station, half of which is today Russian. That, of course, is an extraordinarily strained relationship at this point, given what's happen happening in Ukraine. But I will also say that as you contemplate NASA, we really need to think of it as a great tool of diplomacy. And I do think that the U.S. government has been, um, has not been capable of understanding that it is a it is a tool of diplomacy in the sense that if we get into a trade war with China and they have an interest in participating in something that we're doing whether it's maybe a Mars mission or something you know in space we can put things on the table um, that is in their interest and it doesn't cost us anything to do that but we, we I will say the executive branch and this has been going on for years has not been as has not maximize the utility of NASA as a tool of diplomacy to exact advantages for our own country um, as, as it otherwise could. But I would say starting with the Artemis Accords, which we initiated when I was at NASA, at the time when I left, I think we were in, the, in the, the teens as far as countries that had signed. We're now up to 35. These are countries that have basically stated in principle, we want to be part of the Artemis program, but in order to do so, we're going to adhere to these basic philosophical philosophies and they and, and and by the way it is it is an enforcement mechanism quite frankly for the outer space treaty which says look if you if you're not going to comply with the outer space treaty you can't be part of the artemis program yeah. uh, it's a forcing function and so i think nasa is a tool uh, of diplomacy in these types of areas and i think it's often overlooked um, by our leaders in the executive branch mr Bruno, perhaps from the private sector perspective which countries are particularly important or might surprise us in terms of the capability yeah well, maybe not surprising uh, from an industrial point of view and, and 
national strategy, you want to start with the understanding you're not going to beat China in a numbers game. Um, this is about technology. And so our technology partners are Europe, UK, and Japan. And I agree with General Raymond that uh, India is an untapped resource that we need to take a very hard look at having a closer relationship with them. Because we're not going to win this by catching up to China's 20 years of investment. We're only going to win this by getting in front of them, by leapfrogging them with capability. Interesting. Mr. Kim? There we go. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for, for walking us through this. You know, I appreciate the, the chairman's framing, talking about this both on a tactical level, but also uh, in some ways like a narrative level. I mean, talking about the unifying capacity that this played uh, during the Cold War and how perhaps that could happen again. I guess my question, though, is that, you know, I, is that you know when, when we're talking about a, a race, when we're talking about if we're framing that kind of capacity. I guess my question is 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 what's the end goal? Yeah. You know what's what's the finish line, right? It's like you know it was it was much clearer during the '60s in terms of these missions of saying like you know we want to achieve this step, then this step, and then ultimately get to the moon, right? And that was something that was very easy for the American people to kind of conceptualize and get excited about. Uh, you know, you, you've talked about a number of different capacities and capabilities, medical, scientific, military, but uh, what I'm just trying to get a sense of from you all is, uh, from your perch and your vantage point, is there sort of a, a pithy way to be able to engage and talk about this in kind of broader public terms that can try to articulate what, to the American people, why is this worth investing in, and why is this something you should get excited about uh, and, and something that could because like look that's what it's going to take for us to be able to marshal the resources that we need to be able to engage to be able to talk about both the threat side but also you know the the pioneering side and, and try to engage I mean you know I understand that I took my two kids to go see the Artemis launch you know it's exciting it, it's something that can capture that imagination but I, I'd love to just hear from you how do we articulate what the finish line is you know what our objectives are well, it's continuing to lead the world in an environment that values democracy and cherishes human dignity. China intends to export its authoritarian form of government and its faceless bureaucracy to global power. They've recognized that space is our Achilles heel. And they're using that asymmetric opportunity to be able to dominate terrestrially through military intimidation and economic power. You cannot separate our prosperity and our safety and our freedom any longer from space. If we're going to preserve freedom, we have to preserve the freedom of space. I, I, would, I would add, um, agree with everything Tori just said. I would also add um, the, the, the question about what is the, the end state. <laughs> space, I don't think there is an end state here in, in this sense. You know, when I was the NASA administrator, a number of discoveries were made that were stunning to me, that my agency was working on, and I, I really wasn't aware of it until the, I got briefed on these things, but we, we discovered that Mars is covered in complex organic compounds. The building blocks for life are all over Mars. They don't exist on the moon at all, but they're all over Mars. We discovered that the methane cycles of Mars match the seasons of Mars. That doesn't guarantee that there's life on Mars, could be geological in nature, but the probability just went up a little bit more. Of course, we've, we've known that Mars has a polar ice cap. We now know that Mars likely has, based on observation, liquid water 12 kilometers under its surface. What do we know about liquid water on Earth? Wherever it exists, there's life. And that's true if you're talking about a raindrop or any other, any other drop of water, there's life. Now, the question is this. It will somebody someday make a discovery that will be significant on Mars. And I'll be really clear. I am not saying that Mars has life. I don't know. I'm not saying that Mars ever used to have life. But based on the rovers we've put, we've put on Mars, we know that Mars has an ocean. It had an ocean. Uh, the northern hemisphere of Mars was two-thirds covered with ocean at one point. There are, we have ro a rover in a river delta right now on Mars that is now dry. Um, we, we know that if it had an ocean, it had a magnetosphere that protected it from radiation, which means it also had an atmosphere. Mars was at one time habitable. Doesn't mean it was inhabited, but it was one time habitable. 
you add all these things up and you say, a discovery could be made. Hasn't been made yet, but a discovery could be made of life on another world. And when that discovery is made, it adds chapters to history books and science books. And in my view, those chapters, should, it should be the United States of America and its allies and partners that make that discovery. Uh, because that is a stunning achievement that the whole world is going to rally around. And it would be, it would be every bit as mo you know, monumental as Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. I mean, that is a part of, of information power when we think about the dying theory of national power that, that I think we, we need to lead on as a country. Um, and so, but, but does it stop? Let's say that discovery is made and it's us. Does it stop there? No, that's just the beginning. Um, so I, I would say when it comes to these types of achievements, we have to constantly be pushing the, the edge. And that's, that's really what NASA does. Yeah. I would agree with everything that's been said. Uh, put a little sharper point on it for the American people. Most people don't understand how reliant their life is on space. It, you can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. It's it's orbiting way overhead. But I was looking around and looking at cups of coffee. Before you had your first cup of coffee, you used space multiple, multiple times, and you don't even know it. Uh, I will tell you, the end state, from my perspective, uh, is... A domain that allows for global stability, a domain that allows for innovation that's going to impact every American's way of life in ways that they can only dream about today, uh, and an uh, and, uh, uh, end state that allows for science and technology, uh, as, as Jim has articulated very, very clearly, uh, and a domain that allows us to deter conflict. Uh, globally, it is a space is a huge force multiplier, and although people say it's expensive, it is a an extremely good value for the dollars you put in because of the the great benefits that we achieve from it. Yeah. Now, look, um, I'll, I'll I'll bring this to a close, but um, let, let's keep in touch about this. Let's keep thinking about it because you know I think that that narrative is so key. You know, not just in terms of our work in space; it's key to this committee's work in terms of how do you frame the competition between, you know, the two most powerful countries in the world. And, you know, on this particular one, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you when you think about it, even just the, the, the sheer word that exists because of what this happened, which is, you know, the moonshot, right? Like, I think America is ready for another moonshot moment. Now, whether or not that means space or using, appropriating that term for something else, but, like, to what extent can we say, like, look, like, let's use this for, you know, let's invest on the medical side to be able to cure this or that, or, you know, and, and be able to use microgravity or whatnot to really be able to show where are we getting towards, you know, if it's, if it's Mars that we sort of set our eyes towards, like, you know, do we make that kind of bold claim in that kind of way as a sort of a beyond Artemis? But, you know, I, I just think that it's, it is important to be able to articulate some type of vision um, to the broader public for them to get excited about, for them to understand the relevance in their own lives. Um, but um, I don't know. It's just, it's just something that we'll have to keep at it about. Back to you, Jim. If I could add one, oh, I'm sorry, Jim. If I could add one more thing to what Jim touched on, we now understand that the moon itself and what we call near-Earth objects, which are asteroids just beyond the moon's orbit, contain an unimaginable abundance of natural resources. So when we're in other committees and people are thinking about, you know, the finite resources on this planet and how we are all trying to live smaller and smaller lives and use less resources here on Earth because eventually they're going to run out and our civilization will collapse, perish the thought. About three days from here, there are industrial metals and precious metals that are beyond human imagination the potential to change our entire human destiny, and they are nearly within reach now. One of NASA's great discoveries, along, by the way, with the Indian Space Agency, is that the moon is full of water, and water easily converts to the most energetic chemical rocket propellants we have. In the presence of those propellants, outside Earth's gravity well already in space makes a transportation system practical that can develop those natural resources and change our human destiny. Yeah, I was just going to add, based on your closing comment there, uh, sir, <laughs> space also provides, is a domain that is inspiring. When I was a young kid, Tori, uh, same, I'm sure, watched man walk on the moon, and we're inspired by that. 
I'll tell you today with all the things that are going on in all sectors of space, whether it's civil with NASA, uh, national security with uh, uh, with the Space Force, and, uh, or with the commercial industry that is so vibrant, uh, what you're seeing today is you have more people applying for STEM-related degrees in universities than we've ever had before. I've, I've gone around, maybe, I don't want to say that, in recent times, I've gone around and talked to, to university presidents, and there's a lot more interest in this. I think that's going to pay dividends for our nation for years and years and years to come. Yeah. Uh, Carlos? I don't, I don't have a list. Yeah. Everyone will have time. Don't worry. Sure. Hey, I've been a, a huge fan of space since I was a kid. Um, and I remember the, the first moon landing, and um, I think it was, I was um, 14 years old at the time. Uh, also, also um, a student of history, and, and, and if anything, history's taught me anything, is that the, the nations that lead the world are the nations that are exploring throughout history. Right. And so, uh, while we may have been first to the moon, that happened 50 years ago, we need to be first to the moon again. Because if we're not, if China actually beats us back to the moon, then it will be a signal to the rest of the world that we're on the decline and they're on the ascent. That being said, I'm concerned. We went from a suborbital, you know, we went suborbital with Shepard in, in 61, and we landed on the moon in 69. That's eight years. We've been trying to develop this Artemis program and uh, and uh, um, and the launch vehicle for 10, 15 years. And when I look at the architecture, it's just a souped up Apollo. What the heck is going on? And why aren't we there already? I mean, we were supposed to be on the moon this year, you know, according to, uh, to President Bush, who wanted to get us back by 2024. We're nowhere close to doing that. My fear is that the Chinese are working to get there and beat us. So, you know, do you have any more information? And why is it that these systems are taking so long to develop when we were there 50 years ago? To a guy like me, it doesn't make any sense. I have my theory, and my theory is a fear of failure. Uh, uh, so no, that's so that, that hampers us because, you know, if, if something blows up with NASA, you've got two years worth of, of hearings as to why that thing blew up. That's right. And whereas other folks, like you get, you know, Musk and SpaceX, it blows up. Hey, great. That's fantastic. It was a success. Let's do it again. All right. And we need to get past that here in Congress. All right. So, so you know, if you can give me your insights on that, I appreciate it. I, I think there's a number of things uh, over time that have conspired to slow our progress to the moon and obviously then to Mars. But I think, um, I think to start, um, we have had programs started and stopped with the whimsical budgets of politicians. And I'm not saying that to be critical of this body, but I am certainly being critical of this body. Sure. Um, so, the, and I've been a part of it. I remember when I was on the science committee, my very first hearing was about um, this mission, the asteroid redirect mission. And, and it was interesting how um, int all of the Democrats were in favor of going to Mars and all of the Republicans were in favor of going to the moon. And we were debating whether we we're gonna go to the moon or Mars. And I remember thinking how dumb it is that this is a partisan, a, a, a divisive partisan issue. Well, if you, if you back up, it, it's, it's one administration starts a program, the next administration cancels it and starts another program, the next administration cancels that one and starts another program. This has been going on, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush had the Space Exploration Initiative. It got canceled for a different initiative. Then George W. Bush had the vision for space exploration, included the Constellation program, that got canceled. And so, yes, it is, it is, it is starts and stops and wasted billions of dollars and lots of time. Now, all that being said, what is the solution? And there's other issues, I want to be really clear. This nation made a determination years ago that we were going to build the International Space Station, which has now been in orbit for We've had people living and working in space for 25 years in a row, which is a stunning achievement. It's also an extraordinarily expensive achievement. So 
The question is, how long do we want the government operating a space station in low Earth orbit, or do we want to transfer that to commercial partners, and then the government can do what point, for example, going to the moon and then onto Mars. So we have to make these transitions. I will tell you, we're also terrible as a nation at making these transitions. We look at when the space shuttle ended, we had you know, a 10-year gap before we had you know, commercial crew launching astronauts to the International Space Station. By the way, during that time, we're spending $100 million a seat with the Russian Soyuz rockets to get to the International Space Station. These are policy decisions that are, that are made uh, whimsically um, based on whoever's in office at the time, and what we need is stability. And I'll tell you, there's two ways to go about doing that. Number one, we need congressional authorization that is that is up to date every year, which doesn't happen. I think it's it's very rare that NASA has an authorization in a given year. Um, and then we need we need appropriations that are consistent year in and year out. Um, and and we haven't had that either. Uh, and and I, I also want to be clear: um, there's there are things that we can do apart from Congress, which is how do we commercialize as much of these capabilities as possible, so that so that the budgets are not dependent on you know, whether or not the NASA budget is going up, which this year it's being cut, which now throws everything into a frenzy. We're having to make, I say we, I'm no longer at NASA to be clear, but hard decisions are having to be made right now. And, and money, by, by cutting the money, you actually waste the money because at the end of the day, we don't achieve the accomplishments that we set out to achieve. So uh, the, I've got other theories and ideas, Congressman. I'd love to talk to you at length about it, but I think um, those are just... Some of them. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'll, I'm a military person, not a civil person, so I won't talk about the race to the moon, although I think it's critical. But I will talk about the need to go fast. And I got asked, I used to get asked when I was the chief of space operation, I used to get asked all the time, what kept you awake at night? And it wasn't the technology piece that was keeping me awake at night. It was how fast they were going and how slow we were going. And I look back in our history, we've had, we've had, in our history, as you mentioned, as relating to the moon, we've had the ability to go fast before. From my perspective, what has happened is we we have controlled the shot clock for so long on the, on the national security side, and we don't anymore. And we had the luxury of controlling that and being able to pace, um, pace how we deliver capabilities. The capabilities that we have today are very large, very exquisite, very expensive, and you don't get a do-over if you launch them and they don't work. And so it drives a risk tolerance that is uh, that you can't accept a lot of risk on. Well, what the Space Force is trying to do with leveraging commercial industry in a, to a greater extent is to be able to change that risk calculus um, and to be able to move at speeds that we haven't been able to do before. So you'll hear about the, the shift from large exquisite to proliferated smaller satellites that are cheaper, that are coming off of an assembly line. So if something doesn't work, it doesn't matter because it's, there's another one coming off in an hour. Right. Uh, that's not the model that we have today. And so, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the, the most consequential work the Space Force is doing is making that shift to a, to a, a new model, a hybrid model. There'll be, there'll be large exquisite things, but there'll be others that will allow us to go at speed and to, to uh, be more innovative, leverage commercial and leverage international partners in a way that we haven't been able to do so. Add the perspective that uh, Jim pointed out, China has a strength in that they are able to set a plan and stay on it for yeah. 5, 10, 15 years. And obviously that is a strength that they have, but it also means they are vulnerable to disruption. So when we have a plan, we should follow it through, but we also need to leverage this partnership we have with industry, with government, our ability to innovate, and uh, you know let them go ahead and spend... 15 or 20 years, and then disrupt them at the end. There isn't a single technology that I see China applying in space, or by the way, in things like hypersonics, that I did not personally work on myself 20 years ago. We set those down when we pivoted to the global war on terror. They stole that technology, and they have kept with it all this time. And that's why today it looks like they're going super fast, because we're at the end of that long chain. That's OK. We'll just innovate something else, send them back 20 years. If I could piggyback, and I agree with everything that Tori just said, I, I would add, the, I think 
and I've said this a lot even when I was at NASA, we, we will never out-centrally plan China because we have too many members of Congress and senators with special interests in their districts. And so we, we also have a governance issue where, you know, we're, we're building hardware that may be obsolete because it's protecting jobs in somebody's home district. So we, we can't out-centrally plan China, but what we can do, and this is I think what Tori is talking about, we can out-entrepreneur China. And that's where the innovation takes place. That's where the stunning, you know, developments that, for example, you know, dropping the cost of access to space, which I know Tori has been working on for a decade now, um, those things are coming online now that are going to be fundamentally transformational for this nation. And, it, and those programs are not, are not, they're not driven by a government. They're driven by the government setting conditions that say, we want to buy your service, who can provide us the best access at the lowest price, and then the, the entrepreneurial spirit of this country takes over. And that's the transformation that where, where we can definitely outpace China. Ms. Stevens and Ms. Dr. Dow. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and I'd, I'd be remiss not to thank you for a great term uh, and your leadership in the chairmanship. I believe this is my last meeting with you in this role, and um, I, I would just say it's been uh, a sincere honor to travel the world with you and to engage in uh, a topic, a career topic of, of a lifetime, which is the U.S. Uh, competition with with China and rest assured sir that the the work will continue uh, your your voice will be missed and your rigorous running of committee meetings and hearings and getting us all on airplanes and <laughs> moving around at the same time uh, but, but thank you and on behalf of the Midwest uh, we thank you also for your, your leadership. You. I'd like to come back to Detroit though, provided we go to a better bar than Molinar took us to. I think that about was, that every day. <laughs> very weird. It was very weird. Uh, story for a different day. <laughs> it was odd though. Uh, rain check, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And certainly, Mr. Bridenstein, it's nice to see you again, and I, I think back to some of the, the time that we got to spend together uh, when you were the NAS administrator, and I was just a newly elected member of, of Congress on the House Science and Space uh, Technology Committee, which I'm still on, even though I'm in the minority party, but we're uh, continuing to work together in a very collaborative and bipartisan way. And um, Mr. Jimenez was also on science, but you left us, so now I, I get to boast the role of being the only uh, science committee member who also sits on this China Competition Committee. And, and this really is such an important topic. I mean, my goodness gracious, uh, thank you for the testimony and, and, and the Q&As of which I've been able to participate in this far. I, I wanted to actually follow up on the low Earth orbit and the hypersonics and, and just trying to almost back this out a minute to, to really understand what we can do to compete because I happen to have a conversation with Ravada, which is kind of an American company, kind of in Europe or London and all this and that, and they're doing the low earth orbit satellites uh, tied to hypersonics and speaking directly to the CEO, just as this select committee was getting started, the abuse that he was experiencing on the international stage vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the CCP's want to uh, dominate in low earth orbits and particularly related to hypersonics, it, it was actually just frightening to listen to as a lawmaker uh, and very jolting to, to, to me uh, in, in, in the sense of, yes, I'm from Metro Detroit and, you know, represent the, you know, the high concentration of automotive suppliers and remain really dedicated, but a lot of those are household names. And what we saw here with Ravada was a uh, co company that was kind of a startup that was trying to get into this space of what you were just discussing, Mr. Bruno, and, 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 and yet they, they were just being kicked around on the global stage. Yeah, I mean, we're talking espionage, illegal activities being perpetrated against them, and we see this as clear as day. It's China CCP was just trying to own this, and they're not a known entity, and we're over here, to your point, Mr. Bryden, and just trying to protect, you know, maybe obsolete hardware and doing these little ones and twos. It's like, where's the strategy? 
What do we need to do on low Earth orbits? I understand the investment, and how best can we work with our international partners? I personally find it, who are allies, I personally find this one of the biggest risk areas. And I, I agree, let's, let's strategically invest, let's have a private sector that flourishes, you know, talk to SpaceX, talk to Blue Origin, all the great suppliers, let's keep going with all that. But we, we are weak when it comes to the defense component here, the national security, and what's going on, you know, outside of our atmosphere, where we are incredibly vulnerable. I mean, it, it truly, and, and that's maybe my opinion, but I certainly love your feedback, sir. Yeah, the first thing to appreciate about hypersonics is that that's a shorthand term for maneuvering hypersonics. All medium and long-range ballistic missiles and rockets are hypersonic. It's not the velocity. It's the fact that it can deviate from that path it was set upon. So when you have a hypersonic threat, it's absolutely central to have what we call birth-to-death-to-death custody of it. In other words, you have to be able to observe it through its entire flight path because it might deviate from that. That's what LEO helps us do for a hypersonic threat. Um, when it deviates, that's important because we stop a hypersonic threat or any threat like that in missile defense with another hypersonic rocket. And so you have to aim in front of the target, you launch your rocket, you're committed to that intercept point, and then it moves and you miss. That's why it's a big deal. So we need to observe the maneuver. And frankly, the proper defense, defense for hypersonics is directed energy. You are never going to outrun a speed of light round. It's as simple as that. And when we talk about long range, regional, or, or not theater, but regional level um, hypersonic threats, we need to place that directed energy platform in low Earth orbit in space in order to have that viewpoint. Are we anywhere on this? The directed energy part was also set down 20 years ago and has not been robustly picked up. What we have been making excellent progress on is producing our own hypersonic platforms because they're useful for us too in order to deter China's use of them against us. I would just add um, and use this as a way to, to illustrate two, two points. This I've talked about the shift from an old architecture to a new architecture. The number one architecture that we made, that we pivoted on was missile warning, missile tracking. And the reason why we did that was that today the satellites that we have, although the world's best, are designed to detect a ballistic missile. It means it, it is not maneuverable. And so, so because of the, the, the emerging hypersonic threats, we had to go lower to be able to track those uh, as they maneuver. And so, again, it was going from large exquisite satellites in geosynchronous orbit to many, many <coughs> satellites in low Earth orbit to be able to, to, to track that. At the same time, you get a second benefit. Rather than having handfuls of satellites to do that total Earth coverage and, and have persistence in low Earth orbit, you have to have hundreds. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you complicate the targeting of an adversary being able to deny your access to that to that capability. So you get a you get a twofer on that one. You, you get to do the mission better, and you get to uh, protect your your constellations a little bit because you've proliferated in, in numbers and orbits. And so that's that's the work that I was talking about. To get to your point, ma'am, on international partnerships, I think one of the things you're seeing in space is that technology is moving so fast that it's outpacing some of the policy and regulatory and organizational frameworks that are there. Uh, as an example, uh, ITAR, which was designed to keep technology out of the hands of an adversary, well, that clearly hasn't worked. China has, you yeah. know, technology's outpaced that, and they've got a lot of that technology. And what, keeps the technology out of the hands of Five Eyes allies in a lot of what's, what's even happening? So, that's, that's what I'm saying. What's happening is it's impacting our ability to work with our, our closest partners. And so that's another one of those areas where I think there's, there's work to be done to refresh that, to allow us to work with our allies and partners more effectively, to ha be integrated by design up front. And I think... Those are, that's an example of probably several uh, policy frameworks that needs to be looked at just because of the pace of technology change. You know, and, and certainly has come up, uh, you know, a couple, uh, yeah. and hopefully Mr. Gallagher and his private sector 
role or public life that he'll have, not, not in elected office, will publish papers on ITAR reform. And as the committee continues to, it would be very interesting for us to think about a subcommittee dedicated to this space consideration, uh, partly because it is incredibly mm. nuanced and complex, and frankly, it deserves dedicated attention. What I saw with the, and look this up with this Ravada, because they started going and all of a sudden it was just, boom, we're going to kick you out. We don't want you in low earth orbit for hypersonics. You know, it, 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 and again, I'm not trying to do their bidding. I just, you know, I'm on the committee. I've been doing this work and, you know, we're just getting pushed around. We're behind, 20 years behind on investments here. And the minute we try and, you know, on through a private sector road, go in, we're pushed out. And the other thing that I would say is that there's a lot happening in low Earth orbit. The numbers that we've talked about, the numbers of satellites that are in orbit, you know, the proliferated low Earth orbit constellations that are that are uh, up there today and, and, and continuing to be developed, uh, it has outpaced uh, again one of those uh, one of those frameworks, the, the the Outer Space Treaty. Outer Space Treaty provided a, it provides a great foundation. I'm not saying do away with that. But we need to build on top of that some norms of behavior yes. on how to operate in this domain in, in, in a manner that is safe and professional. And we need to be the ones yes. that, that shape that, not letting our adversaries shape that uh, or uh, put those rules in place and shape us. And so I, I really believe that's another key aspect of this that we need to think through is yeah. what is the what are the norms of behavior that need to be uh, put in place and we're working that very hard with our allies and, and partners. The U.S. has stepped up and has been a leader in that. We've said right. we will not conduct a destructive test and cause debris. Uh, we've, we've talked about we're going to uh, limit, uh, <coughs> limit debris. I mean, the Department of Defense has really put in some, some work. We've worked this very closely with our partners. But there is so much more work to do on that. And that is an area that I think needs to be addressed. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your leadership. I would, I would add one thing, because General Raymond and I have now talked a lot about the benefits of LEO for resiliency and for capabilities. <coughs> I just want to leave you with the one and done kind of uh, impression that's always a mistake. Uh, deterring aggression in space requires multiple orbits. Multiple Leo orbits? Multiple orbits, yes ma'am. LEO gives us that capability for things like birth death tracking, resiliency and communication systems. But don't make the mistake of thinking that because it is proliferated and we can lose a certain percentage without losing the capability, that it's invulnerable. LEO is very accessible from the ground. It's 15 minutes away. That's it. Let's and, go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, uh, you know, the proliferated nature <laughs> of it to brings its own vulnerabilities. Yeah. yeah. That's right. China can choose to create a hole in any LEO network over Taiwan or the first or second island chain at a duration of their choosing at any time yeah. by destroying only a handful of those assets, literally a quantity equal to or less than the natural infant mortality of those constellations through which to initiate an attack. That's why higher orbits that are also looking at similar things are very, very important because they have to deal with the complication of destroying the proliferated assets while simultaneously going five or ten hours out to higher orbits to address those at exactly the same moment while having their conventional forces also poised for the attack. That is a nearly impossible military problem to solve. So think of this as a whole system in order to deter them. And a startling component too, but with that, you will later. Dr. Dunn. So that it's, I, let me add, start by adding my uh, echoing Ms. Steve's comments. You, it's been a lot of fun to work with you. And we, we, you she also chided you. You got to have to continue to work for us and now. And I, do, I like this. I want nothing more than to be an obscure academic, uh, perhaps living in Western Australia, writing about the nuances of ITAR reform. So this is like what I'm suited for. <laughs> Oh, that's fun. Jim, great to see you again. Good to have you back. It's, it's fun. Uh, General Raymond, I, I, we had a chance to reconnect here just before the 
the meeting when I have a son who was under your command for years. Uh, he's a clever rascal. I, I hope he followed your orders more than he did mine. Uh, so well, we're working on several things in Florida. By the way, uh, Mr. Burry, you're a surprise. ULA, and you had a very martial tone to your some of your comments. I kind of like that. So uh, the, maybe you've been hanging around General Raymond a lot. But um, uh, Florida, I want to plug a couple of things. We're, uh, we're working on uh, helping you get more launch facilities, not just in the state of Florida, but throughout the country, and do that by, by we have a bill we're running for uh, allowing uh, tax exempt bonds for spaceports. I think it's pretty simple. It's like roads and bridges, and this is another set of infrastructure. I don't think there's any opposition to it. It's just, as Jim knows, it's hard sometimes to get really good, simple things through. Uh, we will get that through. And uh, I think that's a good incentive. It also helps with the commercial, as we say, as opposed to the, uh, the government carrying the ball all the time. Uh, everybody's uh, enthused, inspired by space. You heard that already. Stephen's already ready to go to orbit here. 15 minutes. Um, there's some other good things we're doing in the education. I heard your comments, General, about uh, STEM education. Uh, we have made real efforts at STEM and engineering specific space uh, uh, facilities uh, in the, the university system in Florida, and I'm sure other states are doing the same thing. Uh, so there is a, some good news out there. I especially like some of your comments on uh, establishing norms for behavior in space, rules for engagement. So I want to ask, I want to ask you to talk about uh, rules for engagement, and I have to, I have to say, I was fascinated by Raj's Lagrange points. So I want to know, to share just a little bit of the strategy of the. Why, why, why own a, a Lagrange? It's a gravity well, basically. But uh, why own the Lagrange points uh, specifically? What, what advantage does it give over, you know, being able to maneuver higher, even or farther out, even or, in, or closer in? Um, and then I'd like you to talk about China threats. What we need to do specifically? Maybe you should something you could kind of point to Congress and say you should, uh, or we need to do this and we need your help. Uh, those kind of things. Uh, and finally, I want some comments on directed energy. And I'll, I'll remind you as we go along. Gentlemen, take it away. Put this up amongst, uh, let me talk space threats. Okay. Uh, there's a full spectrum of threats that are, that exist today. Everything from reversible jamming of GPS and communication satellites uh, to um, directed energy threats, think lasers that can blind or dazzle satellites, uh, to satellites that are on orbit that um, uh, have characteristics of, that could be a weapon as well. And I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, China has a satellite that has a robotic arm that can reach out and grab another satellite in space. And I geeks like Tori will tell you that satellites don't like to be grabbed, and that'd be a bad day for, for that satellite. Uh, we're talking, I know we're focusing on, on China. I think it's also important to note that you could, the same thing applies to Russia. They're, they're doing all these same, same similar types of things. Russia has a satellite that um, they launched first in 2017, then in 2019. I deemed it the nesting doll satellite. Have you seen the Russian doll inside of a doll uh -huh. inside of a doll? They have a satellite that launches, the doll opens up, if you will, another satellite comes out, and then it opens up, and a projectile comes out designed to kill a U.S. satellite. Uh, they launched that in 17, they launched that again in 19. In 19, they put it up right next to one of our satellites, and uh, we called them out on it, and then eventually they moved away and shot the projectile in, a, without, uh, in an area of space where there was another satellite. There's... Uh, um, Directed uh, direct ascent ASAT threat, so missiles that can launch from the ground. That 15-minute trip to space, if there's a satellite in low Earth orbit, uh, both China and Russia have, have missiles that can launch from the ground and blow up a satellite uh, in a handful of minutes, um, uh, which is a destructive test. And China demonstrated that in 2007. Uh, Russia has demonstrated that more recently. Uh, then there's uh, cyber threats. Satellites are basically computers in space. And just as there's cyber threats to, to computers on the ground, there's satellites, there's, there's cyber threats to, to, to satellites as well that we're concerned about and that we're uh, uh, working uh, uh, hard to understand.
understand the cyber terrain so we can protect and defend from those threats as well. And then recently, I just read in the paper uh, that uh, you know there was talk about Russia potentially launching a nuclear weapon in space. And so I would, you know, there's this whole spectrum of threats that are out there. Uh, we're trying to build systems and build architectures that are resilient from by the design of that architecture to be uh, resilient to that whole series of threats. And um, uh, that's really the, the hard work the Space Force is doing today. But it's clear today that space is a warfighting domain just like air, land, and sea. And it's clear uh, that we've got to be able to, to, to deter conflict from beginning or extending into space. Uh, we do not want to get into a fight uh, that, that either begins or, or ends there. We would like to, to be able to deter that from happening. If you can deter that from happening, then you can uh, deter conflict from spilling over into other domains. I'll let, I think the Lagrange points are a key terrain in military terminology. I'll let uh, Tori give you the little tutorial on You've captured the essence. It's a location where the moon and the earth, in this case any two bodies, but the moon and the earth, are their gravity fields are interacting. And what's important about them is that you can place a spacecraft there and maintain that location with very little energy. You always have to put energy in spacecraft. are always going to drift and change in their orbit because the earth is not really a sphere and because other things act upon them. The life of the spacecraft is directly proportional to how much energy it has to do for space keep, or for station keeping, and the grunge points make that smaller. They also allow you to be at a different altitude, but still have the same orbital period. So when the ranking member showed that picture, and he showed uh, a Lagrange so point between Earth and the Moon, you normally can't be there and have a 20, you know, have a lunar period. You would be closer to the Earth, so you'd be orbiting faster. The Lagrange point allows you to basically stay at that same orbital period as the moon. So it acts like a geostationary. It does in a lot of ways, yes. So they're very important. There are places where we would store fuel, where we would store propellant, where we would place uh, observation spacecraft uh, because it's, it's inexpensive to keep them there and they're stable. I like that. How about directed energy? Directed energy has a couple of very unique capabilities that no other weapons platform would have. First, the round is literally speed of light. So the maneuvering issue that was discussed before, you can't outmaneuver it. If you can see it, you can shoot it. It's pretty much that simple. The next thing it has is a bottomless magazine. It's an energy-based weapon. As long as you have energy, electricity generally, you are not out of, ever out of ammunition. And then a directed energy system generically also has dialable effects. They naturally turn up and down in their power. So you can dazzle, you can annoy, or you can destroy. And they're very precision uh, in terms of targeting. So if we are defending ourselves against a space-based uh, anti-satellite weapon, we're able to choose and have options to choose to blind it so it can't find us. Uh, to damage it without creating a debris field, and it's certainly never going to get away. And uh, certainly for a hypersonic maneuvering threat, it, it's really the right and only practical solution. What? Geo we look at you, Chief General. What, what, what can you tell us in this setting about our current abilities in dark weapons? Nothing. Um, I'd say that one more time. I didn't hear. What can you tell us in this setting about our current abilities in directed energy weapons? We would have to go to another setting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's cheaper too. Yeah, and it's, of course, it's very it's, it's also the high upfront cost. It's also the I, I, just be, I believe Mr. Uh, Bradson, curious to get your views on counter space campaigning, offensive yeah. and defensive, such as they exist. Uh, a couple. Of, uh, I'll get to that one yeah. second. I want to say oh, sorry, yeah. to Neil. Uh, number one, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Dunn. No, yeah, uh, come on. You're, uh, allowed. Uh, you're, in the, uh, you're in the club, uh, so you're allowed. All right. Yeah. So. Tax exempt bonds for spaceports, 100% uh, support. It's it's by the way, that's the minimum we need to do. Tori will be the first to tell you if you're asking, if you're asking a private company that launches rockets to space, if you're asking them to build the spaceport, it's like asking American Airlines to build the airport. It doesn't make sense. There needs to be government intervention sure. to build the spaceports that are necessary for this country. So uh, I fully support that. 
I sport even more, but if I can help with that, let me know. Uh, number two, um, the, on the Lagrangian points, uh, Tori, I think, described it perfectly well, but as a Navy guy, I'm a Navy pilot by trade, I would tell you, you have to think about Lagrangian points as like choke points on the ocean. So think about like the Strait of Hormuz, okay. That's good. access to the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Malacca to get to the Indian Ocean. These are all very important choke points on Earth uh, if you want to keep channels of communication open. Those are, those are and they have to be protected. Uh, left alone, the worst people will control those areas. Uh, and that's going to be true in the Lagrangian points as well. Um, to to, to uh, the chairman's uh, question, I, I can tell you as, as, a, as a Navy pilot I saw firsthand um, in the days of Afghanistan and Iraq, the early days, we were, we were using high resolution motion picture images and we were sending them around the globe instantaneously with satellite communications. China and Russia watched us do it. Um, we were using intelligent surveillance reconnaissance assets from space that were giving us a huge advantage in the battlefield on Earth. Um, we, we were, of course, we were using satellites for basically missile warning. And of course, GPS for precision guided munitions and timing for networks uh, when we think about Link 16 and these capabilities. Our ability to project power abroad is so dependent on space that most most people don't understand it, but, but if, if we were to, and by China and Russia, they've been watching this, which is why, as the general identified, that's why they've been developing these capabilities, the nesting doll that he mentioned, the idea that you can, as Tori mentioned, direct ascent anti-satellite weapons. We have never weaponized space in the sense that we're going to target things from space. We've not done that. Um, we've not weaponized space in the sense that we're going to destroy things in space. We've not done that. What we've done is we've used space as an enabler for the terrestrial fight. Mm. That's been our force, our power projection yeah. overmatch that, that has, it has aided us in every war that I was ever involved in. China and Russia are going to counter that, and they have. And that's why we have to worry about these new technologies that are proliferating. Direct ascent anti-satellite weapons, co-orbital anti-satellite satellites, um, with with spoofing, jamming, dazzling, hacking, all these things are now proliferating. And, and so the, there's a new era. And of course, General Saltzman has said that we, we need to have a new era where we are involved in what he calls responsible counter space campaigning. In other words, we have to be able to defend our assets in space. And if our enemy is using their assets to attack our troops on the ground, we have to be able to attack their assets in space. Now, he uses the word responsible, and I think that's key, because we don't want to create large debris fields in yeah. space. But this is a new, this is a new era. Uh, it's a new era of how we as a nation think about space. General Saltzman has gone out on a limb to say it's time for this to happen. I will tell you, it makes all of us very nervous, because all of us who have you know, astronauts in space want to make sure they're safe. But the reality is, uh, th think about an invasion of Taiwan scenario, which I know this committee thinks about all the time. If that happens and China is interested in making sure that we can't use these capabilities in space, think about what happens when they attack GPS yeah. or, or they make us deaf, dumb, and blind. Um, that, that goes from a regional tactical scenario to a strategic scenario just like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a very dangerous development. So we, we have to be able to do counter space campaigning. It needs to be responsible. Uh, but I'll tell you what this group could do. What Congress could do is pass a sense of Congress that it's time for us to adopt as national policy the development of responsible counter space. That's a big idea. Could I, just before General, I have a point of privilege here because the ranking member only has a few moments for us to go. I, uh, he gave me a very nice gift yesterday, and I, I'm bad at giving gifts. Uh, so I wanted to give him a, something in, um, in remembrance and in honor of the No Limits Partnership that we've developed. <laughs> Inspired by your comments about Taiwan, I want this to forever hang in your uh, in your office. This is us doing the predator handshake on a mountain in Taiwan. A strength of a sign of strength in America and congressional partnership. So I'll sign this and get it to your office. But I just wanted to hand this to you right here. So yeah, here, here, perfect. Awesome. I'm gonna.
a sharpie. I'm gonna say something here. I'll have it delivered yeah, to your office. Nice. But nice. Yeah, yeah, something nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a mustache on you, and uh, this is gonna be a bubble. I'm so. sorry. I'm, I'm yeah. Balancing All right. Perfect. All right. I'll see you in a bit. General. I would just uh, summarize two things. First, space is a huge force multiplier. Um, we cannot afford to build a navy, an army, an air force, or marine corps that can operate without space. You'd have to have significant amount of more forces. Space enables us to do so much more with with less force structure, and we've we've benefited from that at, at the end of the Cold War uh, and reduced force structure. That's all been enabled because of space, and so you have to. You have to be able to protect and defend the capabilities that you have. On the on the flip side of that, China has seen that, as, as uh, Jim said, and have integrated space into their operations. They have a very, uh, very good space-enabled military. That threatens our Army. That threatens our Navy. That threatens our, our Air Force. We have this sacred duty to be able to protect those folks as well, and that's why you have to build this responsible uh, counter-space campaign uh, so we can protect those forces because they're they're being they're being watched, they're being tracked, they can be targeted, and they can be killed uh, with that space-enabled military from China. Okay. You know, one thing I want to add to that, General, is that we've talked, we've touched on it, but I want to make it really clear: the focus in deterring aggression in space has been largely about resiliency. Most recently, we have to add the ability to defend ourselves. Resiliency is important. We don't want to offer a single knockout punch Pearl Harbor opportunity to our adversary, but if we think we're going to be in a conflict and allow them to keep destroying assets at will for some prolonged period of time, we're not thinking about this right. At some point, you have to make them stop shooting. At the classic deterrence calculus, denied benefits and imposed costs. We have been focused on the denied benefits part of that with resilience. We need to also have the ability to impose costs. Do you uh, I mean one, and then I'll deep yeah. questions. Go. Think about it in this room. <laughs> Turn on the mic. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So ten years ago, I developed a directed energy system specifically for the Qassam threat that Israel suffers. For example, a relatively inexpensive system to develop, primarily because I was leveraging technical know-how from from the Airborne Laser Program that had been recently um, uh, canceled. And so that system was running about 15, 20 kilowatts. It was capable of destroying small, short-range ballistic missiles, drones, and boats. Uh, the cost to kill was about a dollar. It ran on a diesel Damn. generator. Uh, can I can I drop a bill sponsoring that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, Carlos. Uh, yeah, let me just get one, and then we'll go to you, Carlos. An odd question, Jim. By the way, remind me what you flew in the Navy and what your call sign was. I, I started off in E-2 Hawkeyes. I yeah. transitioned to the F-18 Hornet, and my call sign was Brainstem. Brainstem? Yeah. Can I ask about the origin of this? Or? Uh, maybe another time. Okay. <laughs> Over I, I tell people it's because I'm smart. That's Sounds like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the smart part. That's right. Okay, so given that you served here and then uh, led NASA, I'd just be curious to get your view of how congressional oversight of space in general and NASA in particular is structured and whether there might be an argument for some sort of better alignment of committees or streamlining of committee oversight. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, yeah. it does. Um, so I, I think it's, it's important to note... Uh, I think it's really important. We need NASA authorization every year. We need a consistent, um, a consistent kind of framework by which to operate. I think administration, when going from one administration to the next, I want to be really clear. Uh, Senator Bill Nelson is now the NASA administrator, and we've had many conversations about the need for consistency. Um, the programs that I started at NASA, whether it was commercial lunar payload services to go to the moon commercially with, with. Uh, with, with robots or, you know, instruments. He, 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 he wanted to move forward with it, and he has. And same with the Artemis program. He's moved forward with it. Um, and, and same with commercial LEO destinations. He's moved forward with it. All of these things, um, I think, are important. And I would, I would argue that whoever comes after him needs to have consistency as well. It's continuity of purpose. That's ultimately what has been missing 
quite frankly, for decades. Um, and, and, and I think it's important that, that that continues. To the extent that we have Congress involved in an authorization that codifies the, the, the activities that are happening, that's very important because what it says is, you know, when we work on things at NASA, we're working on things that are decadal in nature or even generational in nature. And so, the, you know, the whimsical budgets of, of administrations coming in um, is, is a huge waste of time and money if, if there's huge fluctuations in the direction that we're going. So um, I think authorizations, and I'm, a, I'm an authorizer from the House by trade. A lot of people just focus on appropriations. Appropriations are one year at a time and they can change quickly. Authorization is, here's your direction, and it's, it's in perpetuity. And if, if it needs to be updated, update it. Uh, but I, I do think that it's important to have both. Um, I think the Science Committee does a good job um, on, on, on working to get, I, I can tell you, everybody on the Science Committee when I was there, everybody wanted to do a NASA authorization every year. Yeah. Getting it through the full house and getting it on the agenda is often very challenging. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we're at a, a significant uh, shift in the character of warfare. Mm -hmm. And that character of warfare is really requiring uh, intel and DOD to, to be fused in ways uh, very, very much closer than we've had in the past. When I would come forward with, and, and we're working very, very hard to build the strongest relationship we've ever had with the National Reconnaissance Office, for example. When I would come forward in my job, with the director of the National Reconnaissance Office, we go to two different intelligence or two different committee sets: the intelligence committees versus the defense committees. And there are rules on information that can be shared at the classified level between those committees. I really believe, as in the intel community and DoD gets closer together uh, by necessity, that there is room for some information sharing at the, with the oversight committees to be able to do that because it it really limits. Uh, yeah, with, with both committees. I've seen that as a Hask and HIPSI member firsthand. Um, if I ever come back to Congress, I intend to chair the select committee on the strategic competition between authorizing and appropriations. <laughs> they should be combined into one. They should. But, yeah. Actually, we were talking about yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carlos, you have a question? Yeah, we were talking about that yesterday, and I and I, I actually share uh, his point of view that uh, it, uh, authorizing and, and uh, appropriations makes no sense to me. It should be one. You know, this is the, this is what we want to do, and this is how much we're going to spend on it. I, I'm for that. Okay, uh, it makes no sense. Actually, to me, I'm almost I feel almost worthless. Okay, uh, I authorize something, and then it goes to appropriations, and yeah, maybe they'll fund it, maybe they won't. Uh, so what the heck am I doing? All right, uh, I'm used to being I was I was a mayor, and I was a mayor of a big city, and so I'm used to saying, yeah, we're gonna this is what we're gonna do, and that's how much we're gonna spend on it. Okay. Um, much more efficient, by the way. Uh, so, but anyway, I, I digress. Uh, with, the, with the wars that we've seen, the asymmetric warfare with uh, drones that are flying 40 miles an hour, $20,000, and they're carrying 10 pounds, 15, 30 pounds, whatever, we're shooting million-dollar missiles at, at something that costs 20,000 bucks. We can't, we can't continue to do that, so directed energy is about the way to go, right? Um, so, talking about directed energy, are you afraid that... Um, is there directed energy capability now in space? Are the Chinese uh, developing directed energy uh, capabilities in space? Will they have a first strike capability in space against our assets and then deny us space? Um, can I have your thoughts on that, please? We're in the wrong room again. Yeah, China, can, China uh, has directed energy capabilities uh, that uh, they can use uh, from the ground to blind or dazzle satellites. And they can do that first. I mean, they don't have to wait for something to happen. That's, they have they have directed energy capabilities that they've developed to be able to do that. Um, Sir Bruno, you, uh, you had mentioned earlier that space is our Achilles heel. It, it, just in like layman's terms, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Just because we're so dependent on it? it to kind of to General Raymond's point earlier about we take it for granted? completely dependent upon it, mm -hmm. and it's not protected, and the assets are fragile. Yeah. They know that. They know we rely on it more than they do. They can't contend with our terrestrial forces as they are, so that's why they have invested 
to be able to take space away from us. Got it. And then you also mentioned, I think, that there was something we could do in one fell swoop to leapfrog China. Was that denying investment in their space sector, or what were you alluding to there? I was really me talking that. about capabilities we could put into orbit that could effectively counter their anti-satellite satellites. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Uh, this has been a, any other questions from the members? It's been a great discussion. What I'd like to see, go ahead, I mean, go for it, not that anyone's going to care what I think in a few days. Um, I care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> like Carlos, maybe this is a Catholic thing, sometimes I just feel worthless. You know? um, uh, I think it would be very interesting for the committee to go deep on the space competition with China. Um, and I think there's just a lot of opportunity to come up with a creative set of recommendations, uh, some of which could be policy changes, some of which could be legislation. Your sense of Congress uh, idea is one of those. Uh, and I just think there's going to be a, a lot of interest in that. So either in what remains of this Congress and the next Congress, uh, Ms. Stevens sort of threw out the idea of maybe organizing as subcommittees in key areas. And I've thought that maybe for like, space, advanced biotech, and then for regions that are underappreciated, i.e. Latin America and South America and Chinese influence there, you could have a three subcommittees or, or, inve or deep investigations that come up with reports and policy recommendations to the standing committees. I think that'd be really interesting. Just make sure one of the recommendations is destroy the appropriations committees. Uh, uh, thank you to our witnesses. Uh, it's incredible. Thank you for your service to the country and uh, for your insight. We really, uh, really enjoyed it.